Barrow Bookstore presents a reading of The Birthmark by Nathaniel Hawthorne. In the latter part of the last century, there lived a man of science, an eminent proficient in every branch of natural philosophy, who, not long before our story opens, had made experience of a spiritual affinity more attractive than any chemical one. He had left his laboratory to the care of an assistant, cleared his fine countenance from the furnace smoke, washed the stain of acids from his fingers, and persuaded a beautiful woman to become his wife. In those days, when the comparatively recent discovery of electricity and other kindred mysteries of nature seemed to open paths into the region of miracle, it was not unusual for the love of science to rival the love of woman in its depth and absorbing energy. The higher intellect, the imagination, the spirit, and even the heart might all find their congenial alignment in pursuits which, as some of their ardent votaries believed, would ascend from one step of powerful intelligence to another until the philosopher should lay his hand on the secret of creative force and perhaps make new worlds for himself. We know not whether Eilmer possessed this degree of faith in man's ultimate control over nature. He had devoted himself, however, too unreservedly to scientific studies, ever to be weaned from them by any second passion. His love for his young wife might prove the stronger of the two, but it could only be by intertwining itself with his love of science and uniting the strength of the latter to its own. Such a union accordingly took place and was attended with truly remarkable consequences and a deeply impressive moral. One day, very soon after their marriage, Eilmer sat gazing at his wife with a trouble in his countenance that grew stronger until he spoke. Georgiana, said he, has it never occurred to you that the mark upon your cheek might be removed? No, indeed, said she, smiling, but perceiving the seriousness of his manner, she blushed deeply. To tell you the truth, it has been so often called a charm that I was simple enough to imagine it might be so. I... Upon another face, perhaps it might, replied her husband, but never on yours. No, dearest Georgiana, you came so nearly perfect from the hand of nature that this slightest possible defect, which we hesitate whether to term a defect or a beauty, shocks me as being the visible mark of earthly imperfection. Shocks you, my husband, cried Georgiana, deeply hurt, at first reddening with momentary anger, but then bursting into tears. Then why did you take me from my mother's side? You cannot love what shocks you. To explain this conversation, it must be mentioned that, in the center of Georgiana's left cheek, there was a singular mark, deeply interwoven, as it were, with the texture and substance of her face. In the usual state of her complexion, a healthy though delicate bloom, the mark wore a tint of deeper crimson, which imperfectly defined its shape amid the surrounding rosiness. 
When she blushed, it gradually became more indistinct and finally vanished amid the triumphant rush of blood that bathed the whole cheek with its brilliant glow. But if any shifting emotion caused her to turn pale, there was the mark again, a crimson stain upon the snow, in what Eilmer sometimes deemed an almost fearful distinctness. Its shape bore not a little similarity to the human hand, though of the smallest pygmy size. Georgiana's lovers were wont to say that some fairy, at her birth hour, had laid her tiny hand upon the infant's cheek and left this impress there, in token of the magic endowments that were to give her such sway over all hearts. Many a desperate swain would have risked life for the privilege of pressing his lips to the mysterious hand. It must not be concealed, however, that the impression wrought by this fairy sign manual varied exceedingly according to the difference of temperament in the beholders. Some fastidious persons, but they were exclusively of her own sex, affirmed that the bloody hand, as they chose to call it, quite destroyed the effect of Georgiana's beauty and rendered her countenance even hideous. But it would be as reasonable to say that one of those small blue stains which sometimes occur in the purest statuary marble would convert the eve of powers to a monster. Masculine observers, if the birthmark did not heighten their admiration, contented themselves with wishing it away that the world might possess one living specimen of ideal loveliness without the semblance of a flaw. After his marriage, for he thought little or nothing of the matter before, Eilmer discovered that this was the case with himself. Had she been less beautiful, if envy's self could have found aught else to sneer at, he might have felt his affection heightened by the prettiness of this mimic hand, now vaguely portrayed, now lost, now stealing forth again, and glimmering to and fro with every pulse of emotion that throbbed within her heart. But, seeing her otherwise so perfect, he found this one defect grow more and more intolerable with every moment of their united lives. It was the fatal flaw of humanity which nature, in one shape or another, stamps ineffably on all her productions, either to imply that they are temporary and finite, or that their perfection must be wrought by toil and pain. The crimson hand expressed the ineludible grip in which mortality clutches the highest and purest of earthly mold, degrading them into kindred with the lowest, and even with the very brutes like whom their visible frames return to dust. In this manner, selected as a symbol of his wife's liability to sin, sorrow, decay, and death, Eilmer's somber imagination was not long in rendering the birthmark a frightful object, causing him more trouble and horror than ever Georgiana's beauty, whether of soul or sense, had given him delight. At all the seasons which should have been their happiest, he invariably, and without intending it, nay, in spite of a purpose to the contrary, reverted to this one disastrous topic. Trifling, as it at first appeared, it so connected itself with the innumerable trains of thought and modes of feeling that it became the central point of all. With the morning twilight, Eilmer opened his eyes upon his wife's face and recognized the symbol of imperfection. And when they sat together at the evening hearth, His eye wandered stealthily to her cheek and beheld, flickering with the blaze of the wood fire, the spectral hand that wrote mortality, where he would fain have worshipped. Georgiana soon learned to shudder at his gaze. It needed but a glance, with the peculiar expression that his face often wore, 
to change the roses of her cheek into a death-like paleness, amid which the crimson hand was brought strongly out, like a bas-relief of ruby on the whitest marble. Late one night, when the lights were growing dim, so as hardly to portray the stain on the poor wife's cheek, she herself, for the first time, voluntarily took up the subject. "'Do you remember, my dear Eilmer? said she, with a feeble attempt at a smile. "'Have you any recollection of a dream last night about this odious hand?' "'None, none whatever,' replied Almer, starting. But then he added in a dry, cold tone, affected for the sake of concealing the real depth of his emotion. "'I might well dream of it, for before I fell asleep it had taken a pretty firm hold of my fancy.' "'And you did dream of it,' continued Georgiana hastily, "'for she dreaded lest a gush of tears should interrupt what she had to say. "'A terrible dream. I wonder that you can forget it. "'Is it possible to forget this one expression? "'It is in her heart now. We must have it out. "'Reflect, my husband, for by all means I would have you recall that dream.' The mind is in a sad note, when sleep, the all-involving, cannot confine her spectres within the dim region of her sway, but suffers them to break forth, affrightening this actual life with secrets that perchance belong to a deeper one. Eilmer now remembered his dream. He had fancied himself with his servant, Aminadab attempting an operation for the removal of the birthmark. But the deeper went the knife, the deeper sank the hand, until at length its tiny grasp appeared to have caught hold of Georgiana's heart. Whence, however, her husband was inexorably resolved to cut or wrench it away. When the dream had shaped itself perfectly in his memory, Eilmer sat in his wife's presence with a guilty feeling. Truth often finds its way to the mind closed, muffled in robes of sleep, and then speaks with uncompromising directness of matter in regard to which we practice an unconscious self-deception during our waking moments. Until now, he had not been aware of the tyrannizing influence acquired by one idea over his mind and of the lengths which he might find in his heart to go for the sake of giving himself peace. Eilmer, resumed Georgiana solemnly, I know not what may be the cost to both of us to rid me of this fatal birthmark. Perhaps its removal may cause cureless deformity, or it may be the stain goes as deep as life itself. Again, do we know that there is a possibility, on any terms, of unclasping the firm grip of this little hand which was laid upon me before I came into the world? Dearest Georgiana, I have spent much thought upon the subject, hastily interrupted Eilmer. I am convinced of the perfect practicability of its removal. If there be the remotest possibility of it, continued Georgiana, let the attempt be made, at whatever risk. Danger is nothing to me. For life, while this hateful mark makes me the object of your horror and disgust, life is a burden which I would fling down with joy. Either remove this dreadful hand or take my wretched life. You have deep science. All the world bears witness of it. You have achieved great wonders. Cannot you remove this little, little mark which I cover with the tips of two small fingers? Is this beyond your power for the sake of your own peace and to save your poor wife from madness? Noblest, dearest, tenderest wife, cried Almer rapturously doubt not my power i have already given this matter the deepest thought thought which might almost have enlightened me to create a being less perfect than yourself 
Georgiana, you have led me deeper than ever into the heart of science. I feel myself fully competent to render this dear cheek as faultless as its fellow. And then, most beloved, what will be my triumph when I shall have corrected what nature left imperfect in her fairest work? Even Pygmalion, when his sculptured woman assumed life, felt not greater ecstasy than mine will be. It is resolved, then, said Georgiana, faintly smiling. And, Aylmer, spare me not, though you should find the birthmark take refuge in my heart at last. Her husband tenderly kissed her cheek, her right cheek, not the one which bore the impress of the crimson hand. The next day, Aylmer apprised his wife of a plan that he had formed, whereby he might have opportunity for the intense thought and constant watchfulness which the proposed operation would require, while Georgiana likewise would enjoy the perfect repose essential to its success. They were to seclude themselves in the extensive apartments occupied by Aylmer as a laboratory, and where, during his toilsome youth, he had made discoveries in the elemental powers of nature that had roused the admiration of all the learned societies in Europe. Seated calmly in his laboratory, the pale philosopher had investigated the secrets of the highest cloud region and of the profoundest minds. He had satisfied himself of the causes that kindled and kept alive the fires of the volcano and had explained the mystery of fountains and how it is that they gush forth, some so bright and pure, and others with such rich medicinal virtues from the dark bosom of the earth. Here, too, at an earlier period, he had studied the wonders of the human frame and attempted to fathom the very process by which nature assimilates all her precious influences from earth and air and from the spiritual world to create and foster man, her masterpiece. The latter pursuit, however, Aylmer had long laid aside in unwilling recognition of the truth against which all seekers sooner or later stumble that our great creative mother, while she amuses us with apparently working in the broadest sunshine, is yet severely careful to keep her own secrets and, in spite of her pretended openness, shows us nothing but results. She permits us, indeed, to mar, but seldom to mend, and like a jealous pantity, on no account to make. Now, however, Aylmer resumed these half-forgotten investigations, not, of course, with such hopes or wishes as first suggested them, but because they involved much physiological truth and lay in the path of his proposed scheme for the treatment of Georgiana. As he led her over the threshold of the laboratory, Georgiana was cold and tremulous. Aylmer looked cheerfully into her face with intent to reassure her, but was so startled with the intense glow of the birthmark upon the whiteness of her cheek that he could not restrain a strong, convulsive shudder. His wife fainted. Omnibadab! Omnibadab! shouted Aylmer, stamping violently on the floor. Forthwith, there issued from an inner apartment a man of low stature but bulky frame, with shaggy hair hanging about his visage, which was grimed with the vapors of the furnace. This personage had been Aylmer's underworker during his whole scientific career, and was admirably fitted for that office by his great mechanical readiness and the skill with which, while incapable of comprehending a single principle, he executed all the practical details of his master's experiments. With his vast strength, his shaggy hair, his smoky aspect, and the indescribable earthiness that encrusted him, 
he seemed to represent man's physical nature, while Eimer's slender figure and pale intellectual face were no less apt a type of the spiritual element. Throw open the door of the boudoir, Amnibadab, said Eimer, and burn a pastel. Yes, master, answered Amnibadab, looking intently at the lifeless form of Georgiana, and then he muttered to himself, If she were my wife, I'd never part with that birthmark. When Georgiana regained consciousness, she found herself breathing an atmosphere of penetrating fragrance, the gentle potency of which had recalled her from her death-like faintness. The scene around her looked like enchantment. Eilmer had converted those smoky, dingy, somber rooms where he had spent his brightest years in recondite pursuits into a series of beautiful apartments, not unfit to be the secluded abode of a lovely woman. The walls were hung with gorgeous curtains, which imparted the combination of grandeur and grace that no other species of adornment can achieve. And so they fell from the ceiling to the floor, their rich and ponderous folds, concealing all angles and straight lines, appeared to shut in the scene from infinite space. For aught Georgiana knew, it might be a pavilion among the clouds, and Eilmer, excluding the sunshine, which would have interfered with his chemical processes, had supplied its place with perfumed lamps, emitting flames of various hue, but all uniting in a soft, empurpled radiance. He now knelt by his wife's side, watching her earnestly, but without alarm, for he was confident in his science, and felt that he could draw a magic circle around her, within which no evil might intrude. Where am I? Ah, I remember, said Georgiana faintly, and she placed her hand over her cheek to hide the terrible mark from her husband's eyes. Fear not, dearest, exclaimed he. Do not shrink from me. Believe me, Georgiana, I even rejoice in this single imperfection, since it will be such rapture to remove it. Oh, spare me, sadly replied his wife. Pray. Do not look at it again. I never can forget that convulsive shudder. In order to soothe Georgiana, and, as it were, to please her mind from the burthen of actual things, Eilmer now put in practice some of the light and playful secrets which science had taught him among its profounder lore. Airy figures, absolutely bodiless ideas, and forms of unsubstantial beauty came and danced before her, imprinting their momentary footsteps on beams of light. Though she had some indistinct idea of the method of these optical phenomena, still the illusion was almost perfect enough to warrant the belief that her husband possessed sway over the spiritual world. Then again, when she felt a wish to look forth from her seclusion, immediately, as if her thoughts were answered, the procession of external existence flitted across a screen. The scenery and the figures of actual life were perfectly represented, but with that bewitching yet indescribable difference which always makes a picture, an image, or a shadow so much more attractive than the original. When wearied of this, Eilmer bade her cast her eyes upon a vessel containing a quantity of earth. She did so, with little interest at first, but was soon startled to perceive the germ of a plant shooting upward from the soil. Then came the slender stalk. The leaves gradually unfolded themselves, and amid them was a perfect and lovely flower. It is magical, cried Georgiana. I dare not touch it. Nay, pluck it, answered Eilmer. Pluck it and inhale its brief perfume while you may. The flower will wither in a few moments and leave nothing save its brown seed vessels, but thence may be perpetuated a race as infernal as itself. 
But Georgiana had no sooner touched the flower than the whole plant suffered a blight, its leaves turning coal black as if by the agency of fire. There was too powerful a stimulus, said Almer thoughtfully. To make up for this abortive experiment, he proposed to take her portrait by a scientific process of his own invention. It was to be affected by rays of light striking upon a polished plate of metal. Georgiana assented, but on looking at the result, was affrighted to find the features of the portrait blurred and indefinable, while the minute figure of a hand appeared where the cheek should have been. Eilmer snatched the metallic plate and threw it into a jar of corrosive acid. Soon, however, he forgot these mortifying failures. In the intervals of study and chemical experiment, he came to her, flushed and exhausted, but seemed invigorated by her presence and spoke in glowing language of the resources of his art. He gave a history of the long dynasty of the alchemists, who spent so many ages in quest of the universal solvent by which the golden principle might be elicited from all things vile and base. Eilmer appeared to believe that by the plainest scientific logic, it was altogether within the limits of possibility to discover this long-sought medium. But, he added, a philosopher who should go deep enough to acquire the power would attain too lofty a wisdom to stoop to the exercise of it. Not less singular were his opinions in regard to the elixir vitae. He more than intimated that it was his option to concoct a liquid that should prolong life for years, perhaps interminably, but that it would produce a discord in nature which all the world, and chiefly the quaffer of the immortal nostrum, would find cause to curse. Almer, are you in earnest? asked Georgiana, looking at him with amazement and fear. It is terrible to possess such power, or even to dream of possessing it. Oh, do not tremble, my love, said her husband. I would not wrong either you or myself by working such inharmonious effects upon our lives, but I would have you consider how trifling, in comparison, is the skill requisite to remove this little hand. At the mention of the birthmark, Georgiana, as usual, shrank, as if a red-hot iron had touched her cheek. Again, Eilmer applied himself to his labors. She could hear his voice in the distant furnace room giving directions to Aminadab, whose harsh, uncouth, misshapen tones were audible in response, more like the grunt or a growl of a brute than a human speech. After hours of absence, Eilmer reappeared and proposed that she should now examine his cabinet of chemical products and natural treasures of the earth. Among the former, he showed her a small vial, in which, he remarked, was contained a gentle yet most powerful fragrance, capable of impregnating all the breezes that blow across a kingdom. They were of inestimable value, the contents of that little vial, and as he said so, he threw some of the perfume into the air and filled the room with piercing and invigorating delight. And what is this? asked Georgiana, pointing to a small crystal globe containing a gold-colored liquid. It is so beautiful to the eye that I could imagine it the elixir of life. In one sense it is, replied Almer, or rather the elixir of immortality. It is the most precious poison that ever was concocted in this world. By its aid, I could apportion the lifetime of any mortal at whom you might point your finger. The strength of the dose would determine whether he were to linger out years or drop dead in the midst of a breath. No king on his guarded throne could keep his life if I, 
in my private station should deem that the welfare of millions justified me in depriving him of it. Why do you keep such a terrific drug? inquired Georgiana in horror. Do you mistrust me, my dearest? said her husband, smiling. Its virtuous potency is yet greater than its harmful one. But see, here is a powerful cosmetic. With a few drops of this in a vase of water, freckles may be washed away as easily as the hands are cleansed. A stronger infusion would take the blood out of the cheek and leave the rosiest beauty a pale ghost. Is it with this lotion that you intend to bathe my cheek? asked Georgiana anxiously. Oh, no, hastily replied her husband. This is merely superficial. Your case demands a remedy that shall go deeper. In his interviews with Georgiana, Eilmer generally made minute inquiries as to her sensations and whether the confinement of the rooms and the temperature of the atmosphere agreed with her. These questions had such a particular drift that Georgiana began to conjecture that she was already subjected to certain physical influences, either breathed in with the fragrant air or taken with her food. She fancied likewise, but it might altogether be a fancy, that there was a stirring up of her system, a strange, indefinite sensation creeping through her veins and tingling half painfully, half pleasurably at her heart. Still, whenever she dared to look into the mirror, there she beheld herself, pale as a white rose, and with the crimson birthmark stamped upon her cheek. Not even Eilmer now hated it as much as she. To dispel the tedium of the hours which her husband found it necessary to devote to the process of combination and analysis, Georgiana turned over the volumes of his scientific library. In many dark old tombs she met with chapters full of romance and poetry. There were the works of the philosophers of the Middle Ages, such as Albertus Magnus, Cornelius Agrippa, Parcelsus, and the famous friar who created the prophetic brazen head. All these antique naturalists stood in advance of their centuries, yet were imbued with some of their credulity, and therefore were believed, and perhaps imagined themselves, to have acquired from the investigation of nature a power above nature, and from physics a sway over the spiritual world. Hardly less curious and imaginative were the early volumes of the Transactions of the Royal Society, in which the members, knowing little of the limits of natural possibility, were continually recording wonders or proposing methods whereby wonders might be wrought. But, to Georgiana, the most engrossing volume was a large folio from her husband's own hand, in which he had recorded every experiment of his scientific career with its original aim, the methods adopted for its development, and its final success or failure with the circumstances to which either event was attributable. The book, in truth, was both the history and emblem of his ardent, ambitious, imaginative, yet practical and laborious life. He handled physical details as if there were nothing beyond them, yet spiritualized them all and redeemed himself from materialism by his strong and eager aspiration towards the infinite. In his grasp, the veriest clod of earth assumed a soul. Georgiana, as she read, reverenced Eilmer and loved him more profoundly than ever, but with a less entire dependence on his judgment than heretofore. Much as he had accomplished, she could not but observe that his most splendid successes were almost invariably failures if compared with the ideal at which he aimed. His brightest diamonds were the merest pebbles, and felt to be so by himself in comparison with the inestimable gems which lay hidden beyond his reach. The volume, rich with achievements that had won renown for its author, 
was yet as melancholy a record as ever mortal hand had penned. It was the sad confession and continual exemplification of the shortcomings of the composite man, the spirit burdened with clay and working in matter, and of the despair that assails the highest nature at finding itself so miserably thwarted by the earthly part. Perhaps every man of genius, in whatever sphere, might recognize the image of his own experience in Eilmer's journal. So deeply did these reflections affect Georgiana that she laid her face upon the open volume and burst into tears. In this situation, she was found by her husband. It is dangerous to read in a sorcerer's book, said he with a smile, though his countenance was uneasy and displeased. Georgiana, there are pages in that volume which I can scarcely glance over and keep my senses. Take heed, lest it prove as detrimental to you. It has made me worship you more than ever, said she. Ah, wait for this one success, rejoined he. Then worship me if you will. I shall deem myself hardly unworthy of it. But come, I have sought you for the luxury of your voice. Sing to me, dearest. So she poured out the liquid music of her voice to quench the thirst of his spirit. He then took his leave with a boyish exuberance of gaiety, assuring her that her seclusion would endure but a little longer, and that the result was already certain. Scarcely had he departed when Georgiana felt irresistibly impelled to follow him. She had forgotten to inform Aylmer of a symptom which for two or three hours past had begun to excite her attention. It was a sensation in the fatal birthmark, not painful, but which induced a restlessness throughout her system. Hastening after her husband, she intruded for the first time into the laboratory. The first thing that struck her eye was the furnace, that hot and feverish worker with the intense glow of its fire, which, by the quantities of soot clustered above it, seemed to have been burning for ages. There was a distilling apparatus in full operation. Around the room were retorts, tubes, cylinders, crucibles, and other apparatus of chemical research. An electrical machine stood ready for immediate use. The atmosphere felt oppressively close and was tainted with gaseous odors, which had been tormented forth by the processes of science. The severe and homely simplicity of the apartment, with its naked walls and bricked pavement, looked strange, accustomed as Georgiana had become to the fantastic elegance of her boudoir. But what chiefly, indeed almost solely, drew her attention was the aspect of Aylmer himself. He was pale as death, anxious and absorbed, and hung over the furnace as if it depended upon his utmost watchfulness whether the liquid which it was distilling should be the draught of immortal happiness or misery. How different from the sanguine and joyous mien that he had assumed from Georgiana's encouragement. Careful now, Omnibadab, carefully, thou human machine, carefully, thou man of clay, muttered Almer, more to himself than his assistant. Now, if there be thought too much or too little, it is all over. Hoy, hoy, mumbled Aminadab. Look, master, look. Eilmer raised his eyes hastily, and at first reddened, then grew paler than ever on beholding Georgiana. He rushed towards her and seized her arm with a grip that left the print of his fingers upon it. Why do you come hither? Have you no trust in your husband? cried he impetuously. Would you throw the blight of that fatal birthmark over my labors? It is not well done. Go, prying woman, go. Nay, Eilmer, said Georgiana, with the firmness of which she possessed no stinted endowment. It is not you that have a right to complain. You mistrust your wife. You have concealed the anxiety which you watch the development of this experiment. Think not so unworthily of me, my husband. Tell me all the risk we run, 
and fear not that I shall shrink, for my share in it is far less than your own. No, no, Georgiana, said Aylmer impatiently. It must not be. I submit, replied she calmly. And Aylmer, I shall quaff whatever draught you bring me, but it will be on the same principle that would induce me to take a dose of poison if offered by your hand. My noble wife, said Aylmer, deeply moved, I knew not the height and depth of your nature until now. Nothing shall be concealed. Know then that this crimson hand, superficial as it seems, has clutched its grasp into your being with a strength of which I had no previous conception. I have already administered agents powerful enough to do aught except to change your entire physical system. Only one thing remains to be tried. If that fails us, we are ruined. Why did you hesitate to tell me this? asked she. Because, Georgiana, said Aylmer in a low voice, there is danger. Danger? There is but one danger, that this horrible stigma shall be left upon my cheek, cried Georgiana. Remove it, remove it, whatever be the cost, or we shall both go mad. Heaven knows. Your words are too true, said Aylmer, sadly. And now, dearest, return to your boudoir. In a little while, all will be tested. He conducted her back and took leave of her with a solemn tenderness, which spoke far more than his words how much was now at stake. After his departure, Georgiana became wrapped in musings. She considered the character of Aylmer and did it complete her justice than at any previous moment. Her heart exulted while it trembled at his honorable love, so pure and lofty that it would accept nothing less than perfection, not miserably make itself contented with an earthlier nature than he had dreamed of. She felt how much more precious was such a sentiment than that meaner kind which would have borne with the imperfection for her sake and have been guilty of treason to holy love by degrading its perfect idea to the level of the actual. And, with her whole spirit, she prayed that for a single moment she might satisfy his highest and deepest conception. Longer than one moment, she well knew, it could not be for his spirit was ever on the march, ever ascending, and each instant required something that was beyond the scope of the instant before. The sound of her husband's footsteps aroused her. He bore a crystal goblet, containing a liqueur colorless as water, but bright enough to be the draught of immortality. Eilmer was pale, but it seemed rather the consequence of a highly wrought state of mind and tension of spirit than of fear or doubt. The concoction of the draught has been perfect, said he, in answer to Georgiana's look. Unless all my science have deceived me, it cannot fail. Save on your account, my dearest Eilmer, observed his wife. I might wish to put off this birthmark of mortality by relinquishing mortality itself in preference to any other mode. Life is but a sad possession to those who have attained precisely the degree of moral advancement at which I stand. Were I weaker and blinder, it might be happiness. Were I stronger, it might be endured hopefully. But being what I find myself, methinks I am of all mortals the most fit to die. You are fit for heaven without tasting death, replied her husband. But why do we speak of dying? The draught cannot fail. Behold its effect upon this plant. 
On the window seat, there stood a geranium, diseased with yellow blotches which had overspread all its leaves. Eilmer poured a small quantity of the liquid upon the soil in which it grew. In a little time, when the roots of the plant had taken up the moisture, the unsightly blotches began to be extinguished in a living verdure. There needed no proof, said Georgiana quietly. Give me the goblet. I joyfully stake all upon your word. Drink then, thou lofty creature, exclaimed Almer with fervid admiration. There is no taint of imperfection on thy spirit. Thy sensible frame, too, shall soon be all perfect. She quaffed the liquid and returned the goblet to his hand. It is grateful, said she with a placid smile. Methinks it is like water from a heavenly fountain, for it contains I know not what of unobtrusive fragrance and deliciousness. It allays a feverish thirst that had parched me for many days. Now, dearest, let me sleep. My earthly senses are closing over my spirit, like the leaves round the heart of a rose at sunset. She spoke the last words with a gentle reluctance, as if it required almost more energy than she could command to pronounce the faint and lingering syllables. Scarcely had they loitered through her lips ere she was lost in slumber. Eilmer sat by her side, watching her aspect with the emotions proper to a man, the whole value of whose existence was involved in the process now to be tested. Mingled with this mood, however, was the philosophic investigation characteristic of the man of science. Not the minutest symptom escaped him. A heightened flush of the cheek, a slight irregularity of breath, a quiver of the eyelid, a hardly perceptible tremor through the frame. Such were the details which, as the moments passed, he wrote down in his folio volume. Intense thought had set its stamp upon every previous page of that volume, but the thoughts of years were all concentrated upon the last. While thus employed, he failed not to gaze often at the fatal hand, and not without a shudder. Yet once, by a strange and unaccountable impulse, he pressed it with his lips. His spirit recoiled, however, in the very act, and Georgiana, out of the midst of her deep sleep, moved uneasily and murmured, as if in remonstrance. Again, Aylmer resumed his watch. Nor was it without avail. The crimson hand which at first had been strongly visible upon the marble paleness of Georgiana's cheek, now grew more faintly outlined. She remained not less pale than ever, but the birthmark, with every breath that came and went, lost somewhat of its former distinctness. Its presence had been awful. Its departure was more awful still. Watch the stain of the rainbow fading out of the sky, and you will know how that mysterious symbol passed away. By heaven, it is well nigh gone, said Aylmer to himself in almost irrepressible ecstasy. I can scarcely trace it now. Success, success, and now it is like the faintest rose color. The slightest flush of blood across her cheek would overcome it. But... She is so pale. He drew aside the window curtain and suffered the light of natural day to fall into the room and rest upon her cheek. At the same time, he heard a gross, hoarse chuckle, which he had long known as his servant Omnibadab's expression of delight. Ah, Claude, ah, earthly mass! cried Almer, laughing in a sort of frenzy. You have served me well, matter and spirit, earth and heaven, have both done their part in this. Laugh, thing of senses, you have earned the right to laugh. These exclamations broke Georgiana's sleep. 
she slowly unclosed her eyes and gazed into the mirror which her husband had arranged for that purpose. A faint smile flitted over her lips when she recognized how barely perceptible was now that crimson hand which had once blazed forth with such disastrous brilliancy as to scare away all their happiness. But then her eyes sought Aylmer's face with a trouble and anxiety that he could by no means account for. My poor Aylmer, murmured she. Poor? Nay, richest, happiest, most favoured, exclaimed he. My peerless bride, it is successful. You are perfect. My poor Aylmer, she repeated, with more than human tenderness. You aimed loftily. You have done nobly. Do not repent that, with so high and pure a feeling, you might have rejected the best that earth could offer. Aylmer, dearest Aylmer, I am dying. Alas, it was too true. The fatal hand had grappled with the mystery of life and was the bond by which an angelic spirit kept itself in union with a mortal frame. As the last crimson tint of the birthmark, that sole token of human imperfection, faded from her cheek, the parting breath of the now perfect woman passed into the atmosphere, and her soul lingering a moment near her husband, took its heavenward flight. Then a hoarse, chuckling laugh was heard again. Thus ever does the gross fatality of earth exult in its invariable triumph over the immortal essence, which in this dim sphere of half-development demands the completeness of a higher state. Yet, had Eilimer reached a profounder wisdom, he need not thus have flung away the happiness which would have woven his mortal life of the self-same texture with the celestial. The momentary circumstance was too strong for him. He failed to look beyond the shadowy scope of time and living once for all in eternity to find the perfect future in the present.